It's the secret story of marijuana. It's the role of pot, you know? It was the thing between the hippies and the gay guys. Everybody was on pot. Dennis Perone, back then, was one of the most famous potheads in America. And the yippies would fly Dennis out there, and Dennis would come to our parade, and he'd be like our keynote speaker. So we're talking back in 83. I met Dennis when he came out here with Jonathan, his lover, and Stevie, and a couple guys. They held a whole little road show. They all came out and stayed at Nine Bleaker Street with us. Dennis was a great guy. He would always start off everything, you know, because you got all these people here for marijuana. But Dennis wasn't going to leave it at that. He knew that there was also a lot of gay guys out there who were also in need of some support and some leadership. So he, and he wanted to see these communities come together. Dennis is a very pragmatic guy. So he would get up there and he would start out, Hi, I'm Dennis Perone. I'm a gay man. I'm from San Francisco, California. And he would lead off like that. He would be very inclusive. He would reach out to the gay guys in the crowd, the lesbians in the crowd, the transgender people in the crowd, as well as the marijuana smokers, and make his point immediately and powerfully that our communities are linked, that gay people smoke pot, and potheads are often gay people. There is no division between these communities. We all are brothers and sisters in this struggle. People were losing everybody they knew. We're talking death on a scale, like, it's terrifying. And then I find out from Dennis that uh, Jonathan has this as well as a lot of other people out here. So I came out here to see what I could do. Moved in with Dennis and working for his uh, business down the street and uh, learned about the AIDS epidemic first thing. Here you are, this is the main pot, this is in the Castro. And once again, all our customers, practically 90% of them end up with this disease. So we're right in the middle. People are really dying all around us. There was no treatment in the earliest days. The main characteristics of the AIDS disease back then were wasting. For some reason, the body just lost its appetite. You'd become just a human skeleton. The marijuana would help uh, stimulate the appetite. It also, of course, helped with the depression. You can imagine the list of things it could help with. It made you feel better when nothing else was available. So the earliest drug to be on the scene and, and working right on the front lines of the AIDS epidemic really was marijuana. There's no question about that. That put us there. Here we are distributing the main drug right on the front line. Well, they're still trying to figure out the dosing on AZT. We never really thought of it like a medicine. We always thought of it as an anti-war symbol of our unity with the, the hippies and, you know, the flag of freedom. That was our bias, that was our outlook. But when we saw it out here, suddenly our minds started wrapping around this and we realized we have to share this story. same time around us something else was happening and that's Brownie Mary and she was secretly bringing patients brownies as an underground thing and she was just doing this overtime I mean she was making a lot of brownies she had a major distribution thing going and we had never heard of it we had no idea and Dennis and her were friends but we didn't know and one day the phone rings and it turns out of all things it's coming from Casadero California a little town up north and it's a bust. And uh, it turns out it's Brownie Mary got busted. And what it is, is she was at her, her nephew Steve's house. For some reason, the cops come raid Steve. They catch her, nothing more to say. They get her baking brownies, that's what they got. But they got her, it's a stone cold bust. Baking brownies and distributing marijuana. That's completely illegal, you're going to jail. So they call us, what do we do? Dennis calls immediately, just goes, uh, we fight, we kill them, we destroy them. This is the best news I've ever heard in my life. He says, you stand strong, 
Let me get back to you in a few minutes. He gets on the phone, doesn't even stop anything, just grabs a cup of coffee here, grabs his Rolodex, this beaten down little Rolodex he had, all these cards, because he had every media contact you can imagine. They'd all interviewed him at some point. They loved Dennis. And he just starts calling. Hey, KGO, CBS, ABC, I have a story for you. They have busted this old lady in Casadero, and she's giving away brownies to AIDS patients. Next thing you know, she's our first break into the media. We have somebody that can really tell a story that America is going to listen to and love. The trial, she killed them. They tried like hell to get out of that one. Boy, did they try to get out of that one. Eventually, they just said, forget it. We give up. Not guilty. <laughs> We're just going to declare you not guilty despite the fact the evidence is the Just get out of our courtroom. And she said, okay, but I'm going to go bake more brownies now. It was just wonderful. We had a big hearing for Brownie Mary Day, San Francisco. We we'll used this as an occasion to bring lots of patients. Dennis choreographed this like you wouldn't believe for all these patients up there who one after another after another spoke about their immediate pressing need for pot. Why I have to have pot. Why it's my medicine. Most of them were AIDS patients, but we had cancer and a few other glaucoma and a few other things coming out. And it was a real mind blower. The media never heard this. They'd never heard this. So they're just like, wow, it's medicine? These people want to talk about that? Old ladies want to smoke dope on camera? So we decided to do something radical. We decided to pick a fight that was designed to go to court, that was designed to start a court fight, that we, we, we figured we'd win, that would legalize sales of marijuana once and for all. We figured that's the best way to do it. This stuff's got to be for sale somewhere. You gotta be able to go buy it. What they did was brilliant, wonderful. They decorated the downstairs apartment to make it look like a cafe. And then they got out and uh, got a dozen guys that, and a couple women that could, uh, could win in court. People that had serious medical, you know, AIDS, dying people, and said, we want you to buy and sell marijuana on TV. Dennis actually set up a scale himself at a table, big pile of pot, and he had each of these people come up and put money on the table, and he'd weigh out the pot and give it to them right there. We invited a guy from a TV station to come down there and to call it our secret location in the Castro for this underground cannabis buyers club. Now, we didn't have a club. This was a one-time camera shot affair. It was straight up an act. The cops are gonna see Dennis on TV selling pot. They're gonna come arrest Dennis. We're gonna to go to jail. He's gonna to go to jail. Then we're gonna to go to court. We're gonna beat this thing. Simple plan, right? How could it go wrong? How could it go wrong? Red flag, bull, bull always charge. Bull don't charge. Then the phone rang. And uh, it turns out it's the uh, TV station. They've received something like 300 phone calls from gay guys around the city who have AIDS who want to know where they can join that club that they just saw on TV. Now what do we do? There is no club. <laughs> Tell these guys, forget it, it was just a, a gig. It was just a, a, a bluff. Can't do that. So we, um, we told the TV guys to call, tell them to all call us and uh, we'll do what we can. So Dennis did the next thing and this is why he's Dennis and why he's such a great guy. We were underground. They were right over here around the corner at Ford and uh, Sanchez, little apartment. They would open up for a couple hours, twice a day, just like always. So I went over there and told uh, the guy that was the bud keeper there and the door guy, I told him what's going to happen now. I says, okay, guys, uh, and these customers, I says, okay, we've just opened up to everything. We're going to have a lot of people coming over here that are complete strangers. This is going to be the first we've never done anything like this before. You can come or you can go. You can stay. We're not going to throw you out. You're part of this group, but that's what we expect is a bust, and that's what's going on. The funniest thing is that the cops didn't come to that place. And in fact, uh, the crowd grew and grew and grew. We had 300 people before you know it. Very few of the old timers quit. Next thing you know, we're blowing out that building. I mean, it's a small apartment. We've got hundreds of people showing up. One day, a guy uh, 
couple days, or maybe two weeks into the thing, a guy knocks on the door and uh, let him in. He says, you're not going to believe how I heard about you guys. I got busted in Dolores Park trying to buy some pot. The cops busted me and I told them my story that I have AIDS, etc. And the cops gave me my pot back and uh, said they weren't going to arrest me, but I shouldn't buy pot in Dolores Park. I should come to your house. And they gave me your address. And we said, oh, shoot, we're not going to get our lawsuit. <laughs> we're not going to get our bust. They're not going to bust us. What are we going to do now? We're going to open up that club to the media. And if they want to come over there and they want to film us doing this, they can do that. So we asked them to do one, do us one favor. In the context of the work they were doing, please interview the people that, that are doing it. We didn't tell you who to interview. We don't care. Pick anyone in the room, anytime. But ask them, why are you doing this? And the interviews that came out of that were stellar. All of a sudden, all these great people just start speaking about their conditions. A couple years of these interviews and a major change in public opinion. During this time period also, we put two bills on the governor's desk. A lot of people don't know that. They think 215 and that's the end of the story. 215 was not the first thing. The first thing we did was a bill that just said that if you had one of four serious conditions, AIDS, cancer, MS, or glaucoma, you could, in the context of a court trial, tell the judge that you've got these things. It didn't even say you were going to get off. But if you had were charged for pot and you had one of these four diseases, you could at least say that you had that and the judge could consider it. That was it. Pete Wilson vetoed that because it was too radical, too far out. The next year we did another bill. It was uh, not the same bill, but it was another one of these very vanilla bills. Once again, too radical for California. Governor vetoes it again. It was the third year. We did another bill that we knew he was gonna veto. That's when we did 215 at the side. We took a basic thing that we just wrote. We want it to be legal for these conditions. Law shall not apply. And then we started farming it out. And we sent it out to every activist and every person we knew from any walk of life without bias. And we asked them to feed back on us. Tell us what you think. Tell us how we can improve this. And Dennis's rule on this stuff was that it had to be short. These things weren't going to be long. That was the Dennis Perone rule. It has to be half a page at the most. At that point, we also had a much larger club. The club had grown. It had moved twice. And it was at 1440 Market Street which was a 30,000 square foot building, a five story building down by Van Essen Market with eight to 10,000 people coming on a weekly basis. So we get on the ballot. Now this is where everything gets crazy. So up until then, it was a pipe dream. We were fighting a public health crisis, giving away pot, educating people about marijuana and AIDS. Good, all power to it, but we're not threatening anybody. We didn't change anything. Nobody's doing anything. Our laws got vetoed. Suddenly we're on the ballot. Now that wasn't supposed to happen. Washington sees this and goes crazy. Now they're awake. They just had a bucket of water dumped on their sleeping little heads. They've jumped up and they're mad about it. The guys in Washington and the Republicans here in the Republican Attorney General's office and the rogue cops here suddenly team up and say, bust these guys, let's make it a crime scene. By making a crime scene, we will make the California electorate say we're getting out of that mess. They were counting on us getting up and fighting again and again. And by the time this was done, the voters weren't going to know what was going on. It was going to be messy. And that's what they were looking for, confusion. It's all the dust settled. They said, what are you going to do now? We're going to stop. We're not going to open up. We got this far. We're close to the finish line. If the voters want this to happen, they're going to have to vote for it. They come over to this house and they, they kick the door down and they go upstairs and they grab Dennis and arrest him. So that the headlines say that the author of Prop 215 was arrested and is in jail. The result was it bumped us six points up in the polls. So we won the election. 
greatest party on the face of the earth. I mean, the club, the man on an election night was standing room only. The smoke just pouring out of the windows of that building. I mean, holy God, man, you just would have sworn it was a five alarm fire. It was great. 